we are live we can start thanks thanks dipti uh, welcome everyone uh, welcome to the c city conversation series uh, i am anuj daga and i am an assistant professor at the school of environment and architecture uh, and uh, for those of you who are attending this this series you may know that uh, we are running the many languages many architecture series where we are investigating into modes of drawing and representation uh, and uh, expression in architecture and how it addresses our contemporary modes of thinking about space uh, and uh, we have had very interesting lineup of uh, speakers over the last three sessions and uh, today we are very um, excited uh, for this session with edward cabe uh, and um, uh, we are um, uh 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 we are being told that uh, edward uh, will be talking about the role of drawing technology and computation in architectural design and we found him in our research uh, very interestingly where we found drawings which are not uh, primarily made by human hand but by machine and that's what kind of uh, interested us a lot and we followed him up and edward was very kind to kind of uh, get on board uh, in joining this, this series uh he'll definitely talk about his experimentation uh, in drawing uh, and his in his practice but let me uh, just uh, offer a formal introduction after which i'll call edward to talk about his process of exploring architecture and drawing so uh, edward cabe is a belgian swiss barcelona based architect where he's both the founder and principal of apfel an experimental architectural office he directs research and academic programs at the institute for advanced architecture of catalonia which you may know as iac or iac and runs machinic protocols uh, an experimental project into creative automation his predominant interest in the notion of craft has brought both his architectural and artistic practices to question seeming dichotomies such as chance and intent situated in the parallelism of the analog and the digital um, it frequently blurs their distinction in his practice his research often aims at staging indeterminable situations exploring through protocols and automation self informing processes of a reciprocal nature that are capable to simultaneously generate and become his investigations into different materialities related to drawing painting or spatial interventions that he calls micro geographies opens up the discourse of what we what determines a creative process and how beaut a beautifully designed system of iterative translations can bring about directed yet infinitely surprising outcomes so with that introduction i'm really eager to look at the experiments of edward and over to you great anush thank you so much for this uh, for this very nice introduction uh, thanks to you and to the to the entire team at at c for the for the invitation i've been really looking forward actually to to give this lecture um all right i'm going to start by sharing screen um great so the lecture i'm going to give today is actually structured in two parts uh, one part that is really about experimental drawing practice and then the other part is about actually a research project in which drawing has a kind of special uh, special role but before i i um, i get into it let me tell you a little bit about where we are so um as you mentioned i'm an architect with with a kind of foot also into the into the art world um but um the, the the place where we're located is called Pablo Nou. It's an area of Barcelona, which is the old industrial quarters of the of the city, which over the course of the last 20 years have been kind of uh, heavily uh, reworked as part of an urban plan, um, an urban plan in which um, the city has tried to keep kind of this vibrant uh, landscape of industry, uh, but also to bring other uh, other functions. There's a lot of housing that has now come into this area, but more specifically also uh, academia, and the city has pushed for kind of companies from the field of new technologies to move in. So there is a kind of ecosystem in um, in Poblano where um, where people work with technology, but since it is in the old industrial quarters, craft has also somehow kept be kept as as part of the game. So we we inscribe ourselves in this kind of situation where um, the digital world and the physical world uh, kind of meet 
or, or merge. And this is our working space, uh, where I am right now, actually, which is typically um, uh, a place that we, that we got and that we refurbished with the use of CNC machines um, that, are, that, that is actually within a kind of radius of 200 uh, meters. So I like a lot this idea of, uh, of design and making almost at the same time. I'll be, uh, I'll be talking about this. So here you see a drawing of the, of the refurbishment of the office in which we actually drew every single part in order to, to mill it. No? That's what we see maybe in this slightly more detailed or zoomed in version. And, and uh, of course, this is a 3D model, uh, but, the, but, but all of these 3D parts are literally drawn. So even though we work with some robotic means, in this case, a CNC machine, um, uh, the, the kind of process of drawing is actually very important. So here we are. Uh, this is in the beginning of the office life when it was recently refurbished. By now, it's a little bit more, um, a little bit more alive or maybe messy, I could say. And, um, and 200 meters from here is IAC, the school where, uh, where I've been teaching since, since 10 years, the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia. IAC is, uh, is, a, is a university, it's part of the Polytechnic of, uh, of Catalonia. It's an architecture school where we explore actually the, the, the potential of technology across different scales, from urbanism to architecture to also construction. And I think one of the particularities of this school is that we have some classrooms, but not many. Most of it uh, are these kind of big spaces in which uh, we kind of collaborate with, uh, with the equipment that we have. So these are typical working scenes at Ariac. Students and faculty work very horizontally. Um, these, in all of these pictures, there's, there tends to be both involved, but also there's a lot of prototyping means, right? So uh, we are trying to kind of, uh, we're trying to, 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 to break this distance uh, that there might be between thinking and making. No? Uh, we sometimes like to say that in the past, in, 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 the, in, the, in the building sites of the past, there was not an architect and a constructor, but it was one figure. In, in Europe, for instance, the master mason in the Gothic period. Um, but but uh, in the kind of current time, uh, there, seems to have, there seems to have been created a lot of distance between the architect and the constructor, between, between the one who projects and the one who constructs. And I think that this is something that can have a lot of kind of difficult consequences. Um, architect engaging less with material, with the building sites, um, and, and, and I think often lack of understanding between these two profiles that can lead to, let's say, poor approach to design, right? So, um, we are uh, kind of exploring and teaching with this desire of applying immediately what we, what we think about. And this, it creates this kind of situation where also with a foot in the professional environment, suddenly uh, students of ours can collaborate uh, on, 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 on professional projects. And in this case, actually run a drone in order to understand the level of, the level of humidity inside a printing wall uh, within the construction fair of Barcelona. Um, but what is this technology good for? No? What 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 can it do? Um, I'm going to explain a few projects that some are on side of the boundaries of the school, um, and in this case, this is a, an experiment with uh, with with Michel Gondry that you see here on the left. Michel Gondry is a, is a, is a very well known film director. Um, and uh, and I asked him to come to to IAC because we had all these technology and I was curious to know what could be a kind of interaction between filmmaking and, um, and architecture and robotic means. So we did actually very short films of, uh, of five seconds, but we, we, what we did is go out into the city, record very short clips, and then actually um, dissect these, these videos into a series of images that we then constructed. No? And I'm showing here one, one project where you see that um, a group of, uh, of students went into the, the metro, the funicular actually of Barcelona, in order to get this kind of very quick film, and then afterwards milled uh, on foam every single one of these frames, retro illuminated them, photographed them, and then made back a movie out of it. So um, here you see the kind of three steps of this process. On the left, uh, a film, on in the center, um, parts or form that is milled uh, by, a, by, a, by a small robot. And then on the right, this milled part that is retro-illuminated 
um, and photographs with a very careful framing in order to recompose this film. So here we watch it again. Um, this, this engages with the question of translation, right? Going from one media to another, something that we often do with drawing, often do in, in architecture, is communication. It also um, let us engage with, with material, uh, understanding an image potentially as something that is three dimensional and something that is a quality. And then also the question of do we lose information in this process of translation? Um, and, and, and do or let's say maybe what do we lose and what do we gain no? um you could say that this is a different movie you could say that this is the same film and and i think that this just raises question a little bit about how to deal with the technology what it can bring you know um so that takes me to, to this little uh, this little um uh thought maybe more than a than a project if, he, if I read this, it says Finland is one of the countries to stop making cursive handwriting classes compulsory. This is actually the title of, of an article in The Guardian in 2016, uh, when Finland precisely took that decision, enabled its uh, primary school to stop to teach uh, handwriting to students, right? And I think maybe maybe as architects, we, we, we at, at least traditionally, we tend to use our hands maybe more than others because of, uh, because of drawing. And, um, drawing is, is a drafting tool, uh, but it, we can also use the hand for sketching. I think it's something that's quite present in architecture, but of course gets questioned with, with, the, with the, um, the kind of recent arrival of a lot of, uh, of, of digital tools. And so um, I like to, to ask myself that question. Do we need, is it good to stop uh, handwriting uh, in schools? I'm, I'm sure that not, uh, but at the same time, um, the, the, the arrival of new supports is definitely something interesting and, and, and something that is going to change our reality, right? So what you have here actually in this kind of little, uh, uh, little project is my nephew on the left, who's learning how to write. Um, and, uh, and, and, I, and I asked him to write this title, which we kind of scanned in real time and then gave as an input to, to kind of our, our robotic arm and IAC, our more sophisticated uh, kind of piece of equipment to actually write it. Uh, in the same time to actually write the same writing. So what you see here is is not actually the writing of a child. It's something that is being produced by a, by a very complex um, piece of equipment. So I, I, I kind of like that ambiguity of, of what's the meaning of the hand within the context of advancement of technology today. And I take this in, in, in kind of different directions. Uh, here, what I'm trying to see is how much I can use myself as a kind of robotic mean of, um, of producing an action. It's a, it's a project for an art residency some years ago in which uh, I engaged in a, in a space with, with actually the light hitting a wall. So I observed the wall for a couple of weeks um, and then um, discovered this moment, this specific moment of the day, reflections, uh, uh, kind of diffusion of light in, a, in, in that wall. And I decided to actually draw that image of the wall back onto the wall. And um, at that time, I was quite kind of fascinated by the work of, of Sol Lewitt, um, uh, in, and especially this kind of attitude of, of, um, of, of producing seemingly very um, arbitrary uh, kind of stroke, but to see how to actually be able to control that or to rationalize. So I went back to this image. Um, I drew a huge grid on the wall, of which there were 13,400 points. And then in my, in my photographs with a, with a simple code, I actually extracted the value from 0 to 14, which was actually the second of drawing uh, on the wall. So um, I then worked for, for basically 10 days with a, with a metronome indicating the seconds, with an Excel sheet that gave me the values of how long I needed to draw on every one of these points. And uh, I don't have an image of the result, but anyway, you can see a bit the kind of scale of the of the drawing. And and uh, in this case, for for the space of or the time of 72 hours, uh, I was just using myself as a kind of robot or as a machine that was simply scribbling with a kind of slightly human attitude on every one of these dots. But this is something that I also take, um, let's say, outside of myself and then kind of set up into more collaborative um, uh, setups. This is with the school of, uh, of Versailles in Paris, where um, actually I came with a set of values and then each of the students there worked on, on one of these sheets without knowing what they were drawing. But then when, when their drawings came together, 
um, I was the only one that, that knew that there was actually um, uh, a pattern that was emerging. No? And, and, and I think what was very enjoyable about this project is yet that you can still see these 50 sheets, these 50 very individual way to draw, but then when they come together, this kind of image comes across, right? So this is a drawing that is done by 50 hands. Uh, with one set of values, and it's the face of Leon uh, Battista Alberti, the, the the great Renaissance architect and artist and mathematician, who in the late 1400s um, actually uh, designed a way to copy drawing, copy information of drawing by using a kind of orthogonal system of X and Y in which he was abstracting points of his drawing into numerical values. So in other words, someone who already 500 years ago invented what we might call today algorithmic drawing, working with, work, working with data, working with numbers in order to locate yourself in space and potentially do a drawing. But this question of the hand, of the freedom that a hand can take, uh, is something that I, I, I also like to, to play with. Um, here, this is a, um, uh, these are 12 drawings that are done by 12 different persons on the basis of a code or a set of instructions that I have given to them themselves. And my objective here is, is to kind of give instruction to someone as precise as possible, readable instructions, and, and, and to get them to produce a drawing of which I want to control the outcome, at least partially, right? And this is an experience I run many times. I had to rewrite often the instructions for these people to um, actually to guide their hand into the way that I really wanted. And then at the, the kind of last iteration of this exercise, these four drawings came out. This is four different people that draw their own drawing. They haven't, they're not in touch with each other, so they don't see the drawings of the other. The only thing they have is a pen, a sheet of paper, 60, sec 60 minutes of drawing time, and then uh, a little paper with the instructions of how to draw. It. And, and uh, what was interesting when these four drawings were on the wall is that the authors of them were not no longer able to recognize which drawing they had done, which is also the moment where I felt that the exercise was concluded because I had managed to use them in a way uh, in order to produce these drawings. No? Here we see the kind of four variants of the, of the drawing. But that's something that, you know, a set of instructions is something that we kind of, I think, as a species, uh, we are constantly communicating and, 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 uh, and working with each other, no? since always. So this idea of the instruction has always been here. But recently, more recently, uh, in the last 50 or maybe more years, a new kind of instruction has come out, or instructions to another to another type of a, of a, of being, which is the computer. And um, this is the result of a seminar at IAC in which I worked with a group of students on algorithmic drawings. So um, I asked students to produce three drawings that would be copies of each other. One drawing that would be done by an algorithm, another drawing that would be done by hand and another drawing that would be executed by a machine. You know? And I think the, 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 the kind of solution that the students did in this case is very beautiful. So they, have a, they ask a friend to make a drawing following a set of instructions. They send him an email, give him paper, and then ask him to draw. They didn't know how, their draw, how successful that drawing was going to be. And then there is also this game here of the surface tension, right, of being able to, to kind of drop uh, droplets of ink onto this water surface in a kind of controlled manner uh, using time and uh, a little bit of electronics and then afterwards sucking that ink by capillarity with the paper. And then the algorithmic drawing actually plays with the idea of the offset, no? with a curve that, that always goes beyond and always actually integrates the deformation of the previous curve. So we see the drawings here again. They are Maybe, look, maybe they look very different, but actually the logics are almost the same. No? And I think this is what is interesting here in this, in this process. So is it about these three drawings um, or is it about these three texts? These are the three protocols. Uh, the one on the left, the one that is oriented to the computer, so it's an algorithm. The one in the center um, for the hand of their friend, so in other words, an email or a message. And the one on the right is a protocol for, for a machine. So this is actually three times the same text translated in different languages, right? Um, here's another answer to this exercise. On the top, you have drawings that are actually done by, uh, by, a, by a computer mean, uh, by processing. 
in the middle you have uh, or the second row you have drawings that are done by hand and in the bottom you have drawings on, that are done by a robot with a comb that uh, the robot dips in paint before actually uh, kind of uh, moving on the page no? and I, I if you look vertical top down you can see that these drawings are always kind of almost uh, uh, almost the same or at least they look alike with the question of are they copies of each other or not is it about copying the form is it about copying the process is it about copying the attitude um, here we, we we enter more the field of, of the machine right uh, this is a a sensor of horizontality in the sea that gets affected by the by the waves uh, and stresses this motor. No? So so uh, through two hours of this drawing, this motor turns and turns and turns, which means that actually the pen, the distance between the motor and the pen, because it turns on itself, becomes shorter and shorter. So in the beginning of the experiment, the pen is far away from the center, and then at the end of the experiment, the pen reaches the middle. So. This is the type of, of, of drawing that this machine uh, from, from two students, Mercedes and Connor, back at Ajax, this is already five or six years ago, came. And then these are four moments of the sea. I like these drawings a lot because they have the, the, they have the, the very precise dimension of time that goes from the outside to the inside. The outside is zero, the inside is two, two hours. But then also this arbitrary position along the circle, right? It's impossible to understand why the, the pen was in that part of the circle or another. So these drawings, they, they are both maps. They are actually very accurate. And they are both also, they also contain this, this arbitrariness. And, and, and I think that, that is something that is Pigeon's drawings, uh, a lot of arbitrariness, uh, but these four maps that come out that are, I find, full of, uh, of beauty and expectedness. And one, one thing that is nice in this experiment is that two drawings will never be repeated, right? Um, and, and, uh, but then yet, they do form a series. They do look alike. They do kind of speak to each other. And here, maybe we're closer to, to, the, to the kind of discussion of the map. Um, here we're in the metro of Barcelona, taking advantage of the centrifugal forces of the, of the metro in order to, to actually um, move this ball. So um, this ball impregnated with ink uh, shows then, 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 then different maps. These are, four, these are the four or four of the lines of the, of the Barcelona metro. And, and I think they are kind of, they look very random, but they're actually very accurate, right? And in that sense, they're really maps. There is the question of whether one could kind of model or understand what the Metro has been doing by, by looking at this. They do embed that. So if we look, if we look at public space, uh, like what, what, what can we do with this? Of course, it can be a kind of analytical tool. Uh, this is an installation in a, in a museum in Barcelona where um, a camera can see on the top uh, these kind of two scales uh, drawings on the top a camera in the public space takes a picture every minute maps therefore the position of the people and sends this photograph to the museum underneath where a computer processes these images into data and feeds uh, for the making of a drawing right? this is the, the robot equipped with a pen um, and this is the first drawing that was made on the first day second third you'll see that in the early iterations there are still some little bugs that actually create drawings with, uh, with mistakes but then after a few days this experiment was really working. And what you actually see in most of the drawing is a plan view of that square. And then on the right, it's a kind of register at the hour at which these people were present. So this drawing is both a plan and a clock at the same time. And, um, and they're all different because each of them corresponds to one day. And, 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 and these drawings, even though they were kind of automated, since their main input is the people, um, they will always kind of have this regularity, you know? even. Uh, even if we, when we look uh, at each other, at all of them as a sequence, besides the one on the top that contains some bugs, the ones at the bottom, they clearly look alike because they have certain patterns of use that that space actually has. And so all of this work that you saw before was actually part of an academic studio at AYA, which was about trying to understand how, how to use time uh, in a design process and also be able to actually work in projection, work in the future, 
design something without knowing what the future would be made of. And definitely try to incorporate and determine this for one expected. Okay. This is a, a response uh, as, a, as a project which, in which the students were um, predicting that the main square of the city uh, could become place that would absorb all the, 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 the waste of, uh, of Barcelona. And depending on the amount of waste that would come, some of it would be transformed, let's say the plastic waste would become urban furniture, organic waste would become uh, urban orchards, uh, uh, toxic waste, or, or let's say electronic, not toxic, but electronic waste could become uh, what is it called, fab labs, or in that but I think all of this project is based on the fact that we don't even know when what kind of waste is going to come. But it's about the kind of protocol so that space to be able to react to different situations. Uh, Edward? Yes? Uh, the volume of your video is too loud to hear you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. So this was a video about the, about the waste uh, of, of the city, trying to understand whether a public space could incorporate the waste of the city in order to actually shape itself and, and, uh, and, um, and, and, and craft the development of its future over, over time. Thank you, Anoush. Um, more, more, uh, more thoughts on, on drawing. This, this here uh, is actually an exercise that I used to run in, in, in a university in Paris, where we look at, at kind of um, typical Parisian squares or, uh, or parks, a very deterministic uh, planning of space, use of space, clear lines that define activity. Different activities need to happen on, on, on either side. We cannot walk here, you have to walk that way. Uh, and I asked the students actually to demonstrate through the act of drawing the fact that these surfaces of this park are actually not kind of one on and off condition. It's not inside a square, there might be different activities. And what the student does here is she mapped the path of people and then asked them their age and understood that there's a correlation between our age and the amount of energy that we emit. So she then used this, this, uh, this data in terms of energy, in terms of joule, the energy that our bodies emit, to make this kind of map of, uh, of energy. And, and this map is about working with a lot of data, overlapping the data, and then demonstrating that space is not used in a homogeneous manner. Essentially, I think it's another way to use the line that how we are often trained or, 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 or using the line as architect in architecture, right? Often in architecture, we draw a line to, as a wall to say that on, on, on one side of the line, we sleep and in the other, we eat. But then eventually, um, architecture, even if it kind of tends to impose things, um, we can understand it as imposing, but we can also understand it as activating, right? And I think this drawing has that, that it's not a drawing of a situation, it's a drawing of potential of what can happen in that space. And um, this is something that, that, that we then take into design processes. So here's a, a group of students that is actually trying to inhabit this chimney, but before uh, kind of thinking about, about uh, how to construct on this chimney. They were speculating on, on, on using this chimney as a foundation system for a vertical village. They wanted first to analyze light, water, or humidity, and wind in order to demonstrate that, this, that the facade of this chimney is not as homogeneous as it might seem to be here. So already looking at the light that creates uh, um, some... Uh, some um, some uh, let's say assimilarity uh, in the in the asymmetry sorry in the in the space then making these incredible drawings finding us in the self in space actually working with the coordinate system understanding the kind of um, uh, constructing language constructive language of this of this space and then um, making a kind of flat uh, mapping of, of all the conditions on this chimney you know so this is an unfolded elevation of the chimney with data uh, of, of, as I said before, of light, of humidity, and of wind. And then when they work with their codes, uh, working with, with drawings in an algorithmic manner, they manage actually to, um, to shape that information uh, in, in a drawing that speaks much more than the one before. No? There is a very important step from this to this, and it's actually the same information, it's just that it's drawn in a different way. So this is an exercise in, in, um, in, in drawing representation. So they're claiming that this, is actually that, right? And, and if they manage to produce this sort of map, 
um, then this can become a very interesting operative tool for the design, which, which then they use, because then this map starts to inform actually the depth of living units uh, that responds to the amount of daylight, the combination of daylight, humidity, and wind uh, to create a kind of um, ideal climatic solution for all of these uh, all of these houses and reduce their energy needs. So this is uh, uh, you, uh, one of our students. This is a long time ago, actually six or seven years ago at work, and and some of the models that that um, that came out of the studio. And I I like the, the, this model because it's kind of a drawing at the same time, right? It's a drawing on a model. Uh, and I think it, it just shows the level of, of design and the level of control that, that this project has. So in a slightly more experimental uh, um, domain, uh, drawing is something that, that I'm also taking uh, as an artist here with, with, uh, uh, with some collaborators in the, in, in the office, um, working a lot with, with indeterminacy um, and with the construction of machines. This is a series of installations that are called the deviations. So they consist of kind of automated environments that draw uh, in which everything is perfect except for one isolated uh, aspect. Now, in this case, the one of gravity. When a drop falls from above, it never falls two, two times in exactly the same way. And the higher the, the distance of the fall, the more this droplet is likely to deflect. Uh, or the impact is likely to vary, right? So this is an experiment in which we are dropping paint from above uh, and basically seeing how it lands, right? So um, here you see the extruder is very close to the page, but then in a moment, we're gonna bring the extruder further up. Um, and what will happen is that the droplet will have a larger impact. It will, it, when it's, when it kind of splashes on the page, uh, its, uh, its footprint will, come, will become bigger. Right, so here you see the distance is a meter and a bit, and, uh, uh, and the yellow and the, and the blue uh, ink, they start to, um, they create bigger impact and therefore they start to connect with another and we see the emergence of another color, uh, which is the green color. So here you see the process, uh, the, a picture of the installation. So essentially it's an Arduino kit that, uh, that makes little drop um, fall and then the robotic arm that is actually uh, moving the, the, the canvas around. So here you can see four drawings that are done with very, very different heights on the, on, the, on the left, a very small height and on the right, the droplets fall from 15 meters high. So the pattern changes, the colors change. And uh, I, I like this kind of last, last drawing to show where we work with three colors. This is actually um, the pseudocode. This is the algorithm uh, um, which actually tells the robot to go high or low um, and, and, and therefore gets these colors to merge. No? So here you see this drawing with these kind of gradient changes where we have some, some greenery, we have some, some green, sorry. We have some brown um, and we have also some, some orange that is emerging out of the mixing of these colors. Another one of these deviations works with a, with a pendulum.
So this is an installation in a gallery in, in, in Paris, no? And it's kind of this autonomous environment where, where a robot is actually activating itself, the, the, the movement of these balls in space, they're dipping into ink, it's kind of fully autonomous. Um, and it's creating these drawings uh, that are, that, that in a way maybe they look a little bit human, right? They kind of cultivate this idea of imprecision in a, in a, in a machining process. This last image here shows the, the, the space itself, not just the results, uh, and, and actually the emergence of this drawing on the floor also uh, that, that, uh, um, that talks about the process, but also talks about the, the, the kind of imperfect activity of, uh, of, this, of this machine. And here's um, a, couple of, a couple of projects that start with drawing, but then actually afterwards go somewhere else. This here is, a, is a, in the center of the page, you see um, a pen that is equipped with some saves uh, and some wheels on the bottom. And um, in front of it, uh, a present sensor, you can see some cables coming into it, that actually understands the position of the, uh, of the pen. So whenever it comes by, it, uh, it reads the signal and then it sends uh, an order to the fan to switch on, right? So uh, this is then what happens over time. This kind of seemingly arbitrary uh, dance of the, of the pen that draws over the course of a, of a day. So this is the, the, another location of this installation. And in the back, these kind of large drawings that get made every day, right? And, and these drawings, they are arbitrary, but they also, um, it, it's interesting because in, in the beginning of the experiment, it looks like it's totally, it, it looks like it's doing something so unique, but actually the more you let it run over time, the more these patterns actually start to, to emerge. And then the kind of addition of so many unpredictable movements eventually start to converge to a, to a, to a result that has a certain logic, right? Um, and this is a, a, a kind of idea or, 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 or theory that we took um, to, the, to an installation for the Biennale of Architecture in Paris, where we worked with, rather than working with ink, we work with sand um, and wind, actually, to try to displace the sound as we, as we kind of know in nature, know, from the beach or from the, or from the dune, these beautiful drawings that, that happen in the sand. In the sand. And... Uh, uh, and created this kind of interactive installation in which we have this landscape of sand that is, uh, that is subject to wind. I think we've all drawn, done drawings in the sand, no? And maybe not exactly like this, uh, but, but somehow sand and drawing are, are, are two things that, that are related in a certain way. Um, but what we did in, in this installation is not only to kind of observe and, and generate these, uh, these sand movements, but it's also to, um, to map them from above. So we have a camera on the ceiling uh, that is registering uh, in real time these images and then through the writing of an algorithm, um, we produce actually a set of, a, a set of drawing or, or actually rather a dynamic drawing. So here you will see the transition between this sand map and between a kind of real time um, algorithm that generates a vectorial drawing, which maybe we could understand uh, as being a city. So wherever the sound goes, this kind of fictional uh, city or, or, or vectorial drawing adapts constantly. But then what we've done is, is um, inside this vectorial drawing, there is also um, uh, some, some, some rules, which means that when it, um, when it grows towards, when it goes beyond a certain density, the, the, the drawing needs to reduce the area. And therefore, it's actually sending a signal back to the, to the fan. So whenever the, the, the drawing, um, there is a moment where the drawing is actually the one that controls the sand um, and not as previously the sand that controls the drawing, right? So this installation, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a kind of, um, um, 
it's a system, it's an interactive system, a reciprocal system in which the sound map influences the drawing, but the drawing influences back the sound map. No? And our discourse here is, is actually the one of context, the one of inhabitation of our environment. Whenever we, when we inhabit the environment, we are always affected by how the environment is, right? Cities follow rivers, or they, go, they don't go in steep topographies, or they actually grow according to their resources. So our, the, our, the inhabitation that we make of the world depends on geography. But at the same time, the moment we start to inhabit it, we actually start to affect that, uh, that environment and to modify it. So this installation here is a, is, is a, is a kind of interactive piece that bridges uh, computation with physical computing, but also with drawing into, into this kind of research, into the search of, of this equilibrium, which it never achieves because there are these two forces that are kind of um, not fighting against each other, but that are actually trying to accommodate each other. Um, then I'm, I'm going to step back for a moment from technology before going back to it. Um, this, uh, I was asked actually a few years ago to go and teach in Switzerland in first year and, and, and to teach without computer, which for me was kind of a, a very tricky question. And, uh, and I accepted that because I wanted to go back a little bit to the hand and also to try to understand in digital processes what I thought interesting, what I thought was interesting and, and, and explore that in the hand. No, this is the type of drawings that that my students would create um, uh, full of, of kind of depth, trying to really understand. This is an analysis of, a, of, a, of an abandoned building in the Canary Islands uh, and, and a student that is developing some ears for, for people to actually communicate from the different parts of the site. But um, the making of these drawings are actually in, in, in this context where we were 12 teachers with 250 students and then decided to go into this collective project that was built eventually by first year students. Um, <laughs> two of them are, are here on the screen. By now, they must be graduating. Yes, by now they're at the end of their studies. And, and I think that, you know, in order to create, uh, to, to, to construct a, a building or an installation or a temporary structure like this one between 250 people, you need an incredible amount of coordination both in the construction but also in the design right and I, and I think that went a little bit through very rigorous uh, drawing so these drawings they are they're done by by rhino actually so our students in switzerland they they learn hand drawings for six months and then in and then they 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 have rhino available for one month at least it was like that this year and so this is the first drawings that these students had done in rhino and, and i'm always really Kind of happy when I see them because I can not only see that they have a certain beauty, but that they are also really intelligent drawings because they serve for the construction of this project. No? So they were really, they were design tools and also communication tools and constructive tools. This is the drawings of the construction of a part of the like kind of the construction sequence of a part of the of the of the project, and I think they're just delightful as much as is the the construction and the kind of last photograph of, of, a, of, a, of a student at the end of her first year. Yeah. Um, then another, another project that actually uh, engages with, uh, with the constructive process. This is something that we built in Nepal a couple of years ago with a group of students from IAC. This is a project that was designed in a class run by Raymond here and also Mania, who is a, a Dutch engineer uh, in London. And we are actually it's a it's a hotel for it's a hotel it's a job for a, for a Nepalese client for to, in order to do a kind of lodge in the Himalayas and all of that is based on this detail this double L bracket that enables two wooden element to come at bespoke angles um, and we designed the project knowing that we were going to have access to the only CNC machine in Nepal at the time I think now there are more. Um, but of course, not all of the project could be built with this. Uh, so it was a matter of combining the use of this robot with the use of other much more standard availability of material, right? So uh, this is the model here where you see actually some straight uh, segments that are standards and that don't need any sophisticated tooling. And then the cardboard here that became plywood in the one-to-one -one project, which is actually quite small part of the project, quite thin. Um, but but where we actually really needed the precision. So 
when here are some of the construction drawings and then the reality of the of the construction so we worked with a carpenter um, at the beginning remotely understanding little by little that this carpenter could not read so the only thing the only way to communicate with him was actually to give him values to give him uh, uh, 3.2 meters i think it was an inch actually so we had to kind of one by one give him the values mark ourselves a piece and then bring them to site um, this is the this is the metal smith with which we actually developed some of our tools um, and some of the building components. All of these parts are actually done by hand with a with a kind of high level of precision. The painting process, the 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 glass of this uh, uh, of this um, project was also kind of partially done by us. Uh, so we got the two sheets cut to the to the size, and then afterwards. Um, we kind of got a profile back from from uh, from here in Spain, where we knew in which shop to get it, took it out of a suitcase, and then mounted the double glazing there uh, on site. Images of uh, one of some of our students here. Um, here is the reality on site. We were in the middle of the monsoon, actually a delayed monsoon, so it made our working conditions very difficult. And here is the erection of of um, of, of the structure, no? little by little. I don't have many pictures of the outcome because this project actually still needs some layers over there in order to be completed but um yeah here are some of the the images where um the sheet of glass that that was put in place actually demonstrates the fact that all of these members are exactly in the location where they need to be and 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 i'm, I'm really happy with with this project because actually it really takes advantage of the little availability of one uh, kind of robotic mean that we had in Nepal, but most of the material that are in, the, in this construction are actually uh, standard uh, uh, local construction uh, materials and, and technique. Right? This is one of the last photographs. This is the round that we built in order to bring the uh, to bring the glass up, and 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 this is the reality of these two tools that we use. No, one very manual, and the other one uh, digital, and the kind of combination of the two. All right, um, I'm going to jump now into the second part of the presentation that's going to be much shorter, uh, but, but I think also important. This is a project that, that we are developing at Ajax since uh, seven years, actually, which is about converting clay. Uh, I got this image the wrong way around. So it's about converting clay, uh, earth into, uh, into 3D printed walls, right? Or potentially architecture. So clay is very interesting for us. Uh, for many reasons, uh, but but the main reason is that it's a material that we have under our feet, right? And we don't need uh, um, kind of complex processes in order to do something different from it. So we can dig and 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 build potentially, as somehow we have always been doing in history until recent times. 3D printing is a is a technology that I think is by now there's there is little doubt that is going to be a very active. Um, um, a very active actor of the construction uh, world in the in the in the years to come. So not only construction, but therefore also design, and therefore also how we live. Right? Um, our group of students directly works with uh, with machines. Actually, in the first week of the term, we we construct our our own machines, start to play with them, and then we actually work with technology on different scales. Right? So this is two of our students, or maybe researchers that are uh, that are using a robotic arm and then we also do kind of these collaborations with with uh, with industry where here we work with a much larger uh, cable robot that enables to print at a scale of 10 meters by six meters high so um printing means that we can put the material only where we want uh, we can deposit in, in in the in the in the position or in the forms that we want of course with certain constraints that means that when we make a wall, we can actually try to find the right reason for a wall to have a certain shape. And that can be according to structure. It can also be according to climate, potentially. Earth itself, uh, I've mentioned before, is, is not an easy material to work with. It contracts, so it can crack. It's also a material that needs a certain care, uh, a certain maintenance, as we, as we know. And it's also a material that in a construction process, um, maybe has its own specificities, no? And the, 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 the necessity of it for it to, to dry um, uh, after it being liquid. But, you know, clay is, is a material that, by now, earth is, is a material that has a stigma in construction. We consider that it's material for a poor architecture. Um, but actually, in history, there's a lot of examples that demonstrate the contrary. 
that it's actually a very rich or very intelligent, intelligent material. And uh, that is from a constructive point of view, from a climatic point of view, but also uh, a kind of heritage point of view, right? Mm -hmm. Every part of the world has clear construction and uh, it has kind of constructive process have adapted over time, uh, shaping society, society also shaping uh, construction systems. And, and, and there is a huge patrimony that actually tends to be lost today of, uh, of antique ways of building with earth and architecture that comes, no? um, techniques, different techniques all over the world uh, that have kind of defined their efficiency over time, maybe, maybe labor intensive. And then uh, this is a project from Hassan Fatih, who actually in the 70s um, took advantage of some old techniques that he learned from in order to kind of revisit them in a more contemporary setup, working with a, a passive uh, climate system to be able to cool buildings without having to refer to kind of domestic uh, electric appliances. And actually when we print, since we can put material where we want, and therefore potentially only where we want, we can create cavity. And this wall here is composed of 70% of air, uh, which is something that in, in this case we use for climatic uh, purposes. We have a, a wall that is, um, we create a wall that is exposed to a huge amount of sun and heat in the, in the summer, and that can therefore ventilate itself. Um, but also we try to accumulate some of that heat to be able to get it to cross the wall throughout the day and to reach so that the heat can reach the inside of the building in the night when it's actually co cool and this, uh, and this heat that can be beneficial. So this is this wall that I was doing printed three years ago uh, with this little ventilation shaft. And eventually what you see here is this prototype that was made. So if you look carefully at the bottom, you can see this little kind of shadows through which the air goes in, uh, travels all the way up of this wall. And then this kind of um, strange geometry that it has, this kind of bumpy geometry is actually a self-shading pattern. So here we study the kind of very vertical sun of the summer, the one we need to protect from. Um, the bumps are actually designed very precisely so that it creates a maximum amount of shadow in itself. And in the, in the winter, when the sun is very horizontal, actually this wall doesn't cast any shadow on itself, taking advantage of them. This then, is a speculation from, from some of our students trying to understand in this context of a, of a refugee camp whether such a construction technique could actually help uh, to, to rethink um, models of, uh, of living and models of inhabitation with materials that are not imported but that actually locally sources, sourced and, and, and therefore cutting some, some cycles but also potentially empowering uh, construction teams and even people to take part into their um, into the building of, of, their, of their houses, right? So this is a program that we've recently concluded and, and, uh, and therefore, um, well, we've concluded this year's edition and we're preparing the next. Um, so I wanted to show some of the results um, where here um, it's a group of students that takes advantage of the fact of, 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 um, of a world being able to be empty, no, consisting of cavities. And they try to understand this from a heat point of view, trying to simulate how heat travels through a wall from down to up and potentially even horizontally. And then afterwards actually designing a wall prototype in which they don't design the wall, they design the performance of this wall. So what the students do here is they draw this orange arrow and then afterwards, which is the, which is the heat path that they want to achieve. And then afterwards they kind of design the geometry for it. So the wall looks totally, maybe looks very homogeneous, although it has this kind of manipulation of the surface like a radiator to be able to, to, to kind of spread heat in, in, uh, in, in kind of precise locations. But what you see is the thermal, the thermal image. Um, see here this, this, uh, this wall where we can clearly see the path and then the, 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 the inlet of heat at the, at the right, which in this case is gas, but it could also be a ventilation system. It could also be biomass. Uh, and then here, the heat map, where we see that the, the kind of students are really controlling where exactly the heat is going to come through this wall, right? So um, I like it because it's a, if we look at this, it's a wall that actually is the straight wall uh, with very little modifications to it, but, but actually the performance that we can see in the thermal, thermal image is really highly precise. Um, and, and, um, and I think this is quite a special way to, to design. So, what would, what would the wall of a house look like? I think we are here entering a kind of other 
dimension of how to draw a wall, right? The wall is no longer maybe some offset uh, lines as we sometimes draw them in a kind of more standardized way of working. They can embed very complex cavities, uh, circulation patterns, uh, potentially. And so then the students speculate on a house that would be a kind of basically a network of tubes, right? That could take the heat from one place to another. But another performance uh, rather than the heat can be the, the kind of visual porosity, right? In this case, um, porosity for light, maybe also for vision, uh, and also maybe for ventilation. Uh, plenty of examples in the, in the world. And the students here have kind of come up with, a, with quite a complex parametric system that enables them to design the wall to receive the light from a certain perspective. No? So on the image on the right, you can see that the wall is very transparent in, in this 30 degree angle, while from the front it actually looks opaque. And this is something that they take into a, into a design project where they were playing with this, this kind of screen system uh, defining very precisely the degree of porosity that they want in each of the walls that they create can enable, can enable them to create an architecture of, that is totally governed by private um, or public uh, kind of qualities, right? So rather than doing a single house, what these students here designed is actually, uh, um, uh, you can call it a series of houses, but what it is actually is they accommodate uh, the living model of, of, a, of a community in Botswana, where these students were from, um, and, and not make individual house, but rather a larger building in which different families uh, can actually co cohabit. And this is kind of the, image, the emerging uh, images of the, of the project, where we see an architecture that is um, extremely open uh, and, and not closed, right? There is no glass, there is no uh, there is no strict separation between the inside and the outside. This is a project of thresholds uh, where some courtyards bring some kind of light in, but then afterwards the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the spaces uh, is really about these degrees of privacy uh, and, and of light penetration. With 3D printing, there's a, a kind of very uh, interesting fact is in order to print, you need to have something underneath, right? So uh, your, your next layer always needs to rest on the previous layer. So um, you cannot do, we cannot print a horizontal surface, uh, at least on site. We could print maybe a vertical surface, let it dry and then, and then, and then have it horizontal. But uh, we are interested in how to print on site um, shapes that can potentially close. So we've been looking at, of course, vernacular architecture, but also kind of maybe examples from a, from modernism, right? Such as a, uh, such as the Este or or, um, or Felix Candela, and uh, so I have, I have a few kind of uh, exploration of this topic of, of how to close a surface. Um, here, um, Zach, Bruno, and uh, and Francesco. Uh, look at support systems, right? And, and uh, this is a kind of previous project um, or previous research in which what the students do is they create a very simple wooden structure on top of which they're going to print, right? So all of, all of the, the, the kind of the development here is about how to build a kind of almost standard and very straightforward timber structure and then afterwards to be able to print on it. And, and this is this year's latest development of that work where um, our researchers managed to print actually a full arch. Um, but what I also find very interesting is that um, the, the, um, the, the wood scaffolding is embedded within the printing itself, right? So while, while, while this wall is being printed, it actually, um, the, 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 the kind of little slots for the wood to come in are designed and, and they are executed. So the scaffolding can come on the wall itself, solving issues of precision uh, and and uh, and also potentially of efficiency. Right? This is a, for us a very important moment. This is one of the first time that we managed to do such a horizontal arc, um, and therefore really I think it starts to open the possibility of the architectural spaces that come underneath. Another uh, another way might be to include fibers within printing. Right? So working very precisely. Uh, with a kind of um, uh, system that, that enables us to lay fibers uh, within the different layers of printing can lead us to create kind of much more cantilevering uh, surfaces. Here you see some of the kind of techniques that our students are using in order to calculate um, what, they are, what, they are, uh, uh, what they want to print as a geometry. And 
I really like to read these as drawings, right? They're not, they're for sure not renders. I think that they are kind of vectorial drawings and then this analytical tool that provides the color actually gives us um, instructions about the structural performance or potentially the printability of this piece. And so what comes out is, is a print with large, much, much kind of steeper overhangs than what we can normally do. But of course, it's thanks to this kind of really beautiful machine that the students have been constructed in constructing in which they can design, decide exactly um, where they want the, 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 the string to be so that it really follows the, the, the printing path. Uh, I have a building site going on next to me. I hope that it's not disturbing too much the audio. Um, but I'll just continue. If it's unbearable, just let me know and then I will move to another part of the office. Um, all right, then uh, other students, uh, Nitha, who, who might be here. She's a very interesting student, I think, for you because uh, Nitha and Brenda uh, kind of developed a, a very beautiful uh, research and, and Nitha is, is moving to, to Mumbai at the moment to work in, a, in the university there. So maybe that's an interesting person to, to connect to. Um, I know that she was on the call before, but I think that she had to run. Uh, I will put you in touch. So they've looked at the dome and, and they've looked before at, at many kind of uh, historical techniques in order to build domes. But in this case, they're really trying to take advantage of the geometry. Uh, by, by affecting the geometry of a surface, they are able to print some dome, some, as you see, some collapse, some stand, and that is all thanks to the kind of very slight manipulation, geometrical manipulation of a surface. That means that micro structural patterns are, are able to be uh, kind of embedded within a, within a surface, right? So uh, here the, 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 the printing tool is, is really serving their advantages in order to create uh, this kind of structural assembly. And uh, this is the, the, the prototype that they came up with. It's a series of vaults, uh, I think, um, very, a very, very rich uh, process. But what, what you see here, this image that I find, this is actually, these are two photographs of the same prototype. Uh, but what you see here, here is, is the prototype during the printing process. And while here it looks relatively, I don't want to say simple, because I know that it's not simple, it's complex, but at least these forms, they have a certain simplicity to themselves. Actually, when we look at the project in section, it's all about how this surface can in certain area also become a kind of lengthy or, or linear structural element. No? So um, a little bit like the Gothic cathedral in which there are structural lines and then surfaces, uh, this follows something similar, except that all of it is done by the same tool and with the same material. I think this is very, uh, I think this is really a breakthrough uh, a project that is incredibly interesting. So I'm, I'm, I'm reaching towards the end. Uh, I want to show just a little bit more because another another prototype, because two years ago, we started to work with a company called WASP. It's our industrial partner and they actually built one-to-one -one printers. So we were able to go to another scale. And some of you, maybe those of you that are interested in, in kind of robotic manufacturing might have seen this. Uh, this is actually a staircase that our students did two years ago. Um, and and um, uh, here we're looking actually precisely at, at this at this question of how to work with with hybrid models, right? Um, what you see is a is a printed wall with these kind of geometrical and structural manipulations to the surface, so that structural elements, in this case a step, but it could also be the beams of a floor plate, can come and very simply slot in uh, a kind of a, a kind of wall assembly. This is a work in in structure, understanding precisely how the step is going to stretch, stress this, uh, this wall, where is the kind of, because of course this is a compressive, earth, earth works in, in compression, right? It works very weak in uh, intention. It's really a question of mass and how these compression loads can transit to the ground. So when we step on one of these steps, uh, um, the loads actually need to be really well considered how they're going to travel through that wall. And actually that was part of the, the whole design work by the student. It's understanding how a wall cannot be a kind of um, kind of homogeneous wall, but how can it within itself has have denser areas that are going to be able to cater for different types of efforts. Right? And so this is this is the outcome um, of of, um, uh, of this prototype here, where, where actually we were then able to walk up and down that that staircase. And and the thing for us, it was a very kind of important moment because it's it's 
one of the moment we realized this prototype was built in, in seven or eight days, that, uh, that we're actually ready to go on site for, uh, for, for the construction of, uh, of real buildings. So that's the last slide of this. Ah, no, sorry, the second to last slide of this project. Uh, this is a one to 20 model that was done last year where I, I, I don't know, I think we, we, we maybe start to have some images of what a 3D printed architecture could be, right? Um, every new technology, every new materiality in the history of construction has led to uh, innovation in construction and therefore to new types of, 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 um, of construction, therefore new types of architecture and therefore new types of inhabitation. This kind of incre incredibly impressive technology of 3D printing is going to lead to an architecture. I think we are very far from knowing what it is, but this is one of the questions that animate us to try to understand best the performative possibility of the technology in order to kind of create an architecture. But it also is a project that is really taking us into this field of the earth, right? A material that is totally natural, is fully recyclable, uh, doesn't have uh, any transport necessity, but most importantly is directly under our feet uh, and therefore kind of, kind of uh, breaks this dependency to kind of standardized models or to imported models that, that will enable us uh, or that enable us already Earth, to create an architecture that is hyper-local, that works with kind of local um, and, and, and that therefore can be much closer to a, to a, to a community or to the, to the local user than the standardized models that we that we know for today and uh you know since since uh um since this lecture and 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 is a lot about drawing i wanted to finish on on this slide that is a that is a digital drawing but this is a drawing of one of these walls that we've seen before right and and uh and i even though this architecture is definitely needs the step of of being 3d modeled and 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 fed to the computer through the development of some code, the question of the drawing is actually incredibly important. Uh, and we do actually draw quite a lot by hand. We draw quite a lot of a lot by computer. Um, and I and I like to say that that you know this this tool of the of the hand or of the drafting that sometimes feels like it might have become a little bit secondary in the field of design is something that in this project that is the most advanced project I'm working on, the most technological project I've been working on, completely has its place, right? And, and uh, drawing is, is thinking, uh, drawing is designing, drawing is constructing in a certain way. And, uh, and if you think of 3D printing, it's actually nothing else than a path in space that is performed by a robot. In other words, it's a kind of three-dimensional drawing. Um, I'll leave it here. Thank you very much for your for your attention. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, Edward. I think uh, I would like to start by kind of uh, pointing out that uh, uh, we must not have seen uh, in a drawing presentation so many videos, and uh, and you know what is interesting. Therefore, to to begin on is. Uh, you actually took us in the act of drawing, which is the verb, and uh, and that to me is the most interesting aspect of rethinking the the act of drawing itself. Uh, I uh, I have some I have actually a lot of points that I've noted down, uh, which not which are not questions, but which are which have opened up a world of new meanings and associations for me. Uh, and the one of the first things that I wanted to kind of uh, you know point out is um, uh, this whole uh, uh, lingering or uh, lingering notion of indeterminacy that keeps on that that you keep on coming back to and the, your entire practice kind of in some senses gyrating around uh, and and um, and if if one may think. Uh, uh, so much of uh, pre-modern humankind actually is built on responding to indeterminacy, uh, and um, uh, and uh, I was wondering, therefore, whether to look at past or like uh, do your work, does your work orient us into the past or into the future? Because uh, I mean, you uh, the, because the initial drawings that you show are uh, so much uh, similar to you know the whole. 
uh, aspect of future telling uh, and uh, these drawings are more like you know the uh, the patterns on say the tortoise shells which were read in the chinese civilization to tell futures or uh, you can kind of equate it to the whole uh, whole notion of palmistry which is about reading uh, these uh, indeterminate lines on the hand or it could be uh, you know reading a, a, of the coffee marks left on the cup and so so a lot of these drawings kind of evoke those uh, those almost uh, uh, moments th those indeterminate kind of patterns uh, or visually indeterminate patterns in which we want to read futures so mm. it, it so the drawings become a very interesting hinge between the past and the future in that sense the drawings that that your practice produces itself and um, and uh, on the other hand one when one starts looking at how it has been actually produced uh, they actually kind of uh, you know um, they dissolve the whole act of orthography which you know we have been trying to kind of uh, uh, seriously question engage with in this kind of series of lectures and uh, and what it does in doing so is uh, it pushes us to think of drawings as maps but not only maps but drawings as data itself uh, not as a representation but as data itself and in that uh, it kind of in some sense dissolves the um, idea of thinking about space as a container uh, uh, and pushes us to think of space in terms of intensification of movements flows interactions or a uh, range of densifications uh, densities uh, to, to to think of space in densities uh, bundles gradients uh, concentrations rarifications and and these are qualities which are often kind of uh, missed when uh, when we uh, when we engage very closely uh, uh, with orthography uh, and so in that sense these aspects give the third dimension to uh, you know um, uh, to to the space in in your work uh, where you start uh, thinking of these abstract qualities more head on uh, and and start kind of reading and making them a part of your practice but at this point i would want you to kind of uh, 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 kind of talk about a little bit about uh, your engagement with indeterminacy uh, and what's what's the fascination uh, with uh, with the indeterminate in that sense uh, uh, and, uh, and 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 how do you expect the viewers to respond to these drawings when constructed uh, like this? Maybe I'll start with the response. The, 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 what is nice about drawing is that we we all we all know it. No, somehow we've all we've all drawn, and mm. uh, and, uh, and 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 it's it's something that can reach everybody uh, very very immediately. And and some of the exhibitions we've done. Um, there are exhibitions in which we put actually all the drawings on the wall, but then no explanations, so that people come in and then they just look at them. No, and then kids are always the kind of fastest to 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 kind of see things, read things, no, and say, ah, oh, this is a, this is an animal, or this is a cloud, or this is a landscape. And then actually in the first exhibition we did, we had another room with the with the explanations, which were videos, no, like kind of the, the, the videos of how the, these these drawings were done. And this was very, it was very nice because first people had a reading and then actually they understood the process. Then they went back and then had another look at them. So uh, I, I think that drawings are, are maps, you no, know, in a certain way. So so they let us understand or 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 embed or record information, but they also unveil a, a kind of huge imaginary, right? And and mm -hmm. and, uh, and and that's why it's it's kind of also seductive to do a drawing. Mm -hmm without knowing what it's going to be. Personally, I've always been frustrated with drawing something that I've always been, been, been frustrated with trying to draw something, you know? because mm. I, I, I never got happy. The, the image that I had in my head was always better than mm. what came up on the, on the, on the, on the page. And actually, I, I worked really hard you know, for five years. Like I was sketching, 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 and mm. I've got tons of sketchbooks that I filled. And I really like these drawings. Um, but but there is very little element of surprise. Maybe there's an element of memory in them, but but mm. and an element of concentration of a moment and, and observation, definitely. But they didn't surprise me. And I think all of the work that, that I've presented today and I've been doing over the past few years is 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 to 
get surprised, to, to discover new things, to, to, to draw for the sake of, of running a process. Mm -hmm. and, and eventually then comes the question of how do you do it? No? How do you, of course, you can do it yourself. The surrealists did it a lot. This, I struggle to do it myself. I struggle to take myself in the drawing process of which I'm, I'm only partially in control. And that's where I have kind of found this, this path, no? which is about basically asking others to draw Mm -hmm. uh, but influencing them, no? so whether mm -hmm. it's a machine, whether it's a computer, whether it's a person, the, the process is always the same, is that I have a kind of idea, a vague idea of, of the type of drawing I want to do, but then I engineer a way so that my body extends mm -hmm. to another body or a device or whatever it is, and, and mm -hmm. that produces the drawing. And I know that in this process, mm -hmm. there is going to be um, invention creativity something that i'm not going to be in full control and therefore the outcome is going to be different from what i have what i have uh, had in mind and and then of course there's always kind of an evaluation of the drawing you know? at the end you like it or you don't like it mm. uh, um, so sometimes it creates frustration because this kind of unexpected uh, uh, dimension is something you're not pleased with because mm. you have some kind of clear idea or others where it's, it's like an absolute uh, delight because it has done something better than you would have done on your own. No? Mm. And, um, and I think that uh, this, is, this is how technology works, right? Mm. Technology does, does things for us. And, and then either, you know, it can be the Freudian model where there is a machine that produces uh, 600 or 6,000 hammers per day and they're all the same and the machine is calibrated to do exactly what we want it to do but more and more machines actually can in the complexity so that they can do what we want them to do, but we don't necessarily what the outcome, we don't necessarily know what the outcome is, right? And I think mm -hmm. this is something in, in my opinion is very interesting in design because when we design, do we need to be in control of everything? Mm -hmm. uh, and we can start from the premise that I think you said very nicely earlier on, um, as architects, we don't design for the past, we design for the future. And, and we actually don't really know what the future is going to be, right? So we are, in a way, we, an, an architecture, is, architecture can be understood as quite a dictatorial discipline, mm -hmm. because we say how the world has to be. Mm -hmm. But then what happens in 10 years, what happens in five years, what happens in 50 years, we don't really know. But actually what we do as architects is we, we place material, we place matter in order to provoke events to happen but they might happen or they might or they might not happen and so i think often we, we forget to 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 understand our discipline as, as something that needs to embed in determinacy and we need to this is a dimension that in a certain degree degree we need to work with because we we are not it's not about being dictators it's about informing and it's about provoking it's about influencing but, but there is something coming that we don't know about. And therefore, I think it's important in design to be able to, um, to, to, to work with this question of, 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 um, of creating something that potentially is going to be able to respond, of which we are not the sole author, um, mm. in which other forces potentially mm. are, are, uh, are acting no? and, 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 and are influencing. And I think that, that suddenly makes design very, very, very different because it's not the work. Design mm -hmm. I, I mean, shouldn't be the work of one person. It should be the work of, of various forces that are created mm -hmm. in order to create mm -hmm. uh, solutions or outcomes. Yeah, in, in, in that uh, line of thought, uh, I, I almost thought that, uh, you know, um, your, uh, your practice kind of uh, in some sense speaks to the Creole theory, which is proposed by Sanford Quinter, uh, where he's basically talking about, uh, I mean, uh, uh, he's talking about how it describes the paths of decision uh, within which, uh, you know, uh, which, which also fits in Christopher Alexander's uh, idea of configuration space. And, and I was wondering if, uh, I mean, uh, creole theory is often used to explain the ways in which uh, different biological species kind of respond to forces of nature in order to, um, uh, to uh, develop certain patterns or, uh, you know, visual um, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, not pa uh, uh, like patterns or bodily transformations in order to fit win, uh, within or exist within nature itself and i was wondering if uh, if if uh, in that sense uh, uh, your process uh, of using the machine also opens up uh, thinking about drawing uh, as seen through another 
uh, as seen through the eyes of another species or as seen through the senses of another species and have you ever thought about that um of of these drawings uh being produced in the uh, almost uh, suspended in gravity uh because there's a lot of like there's no gravity in the drawings um and i i kept on feeling that they were suspended in space and therefore they required a new eye to be appreciated and inhabited itself uh -huh. oh, that's a very nice thought i have to say that i really don't know how to respond but, uh, okay. but i really like that i really like that idea okay uh. <laughs> that that's that's fine that's fine uh, i think uh, there are lots of uh, uh, kind of people who also want to engage with you so i'll just open up uh, uh, this uh, discussion to the audience here uh, mm -hmm. and um, um, uh, there's one uh, uh, kind of direct question which i think you're already beginning to answer but i'll yes. ask it out uh, sanjay mahatre is asking that why were the pigeon drawings labeled as yellow and red line and i'm typing back that it was a mistake <laughs> okay <laughs> but is that true or uh, uh, or uh, oh, was there some thought like, at that point it's of a, time? it's a it's a type mistake so so the the title of that drawing should be actually the time of the day when when this experiment took place right yeah. to kind of highlight the unique moment of this experiment yeah uh, prasad has a question and i would like to invite him to ask his question uh the thief you can help us get prasad online hi edward it Hello. is it is it is so nice and so nice to hear from you again actually it is it is wonderful thanks so much thank you so much uh and 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 and, and a whole journey of uh, uh how uh, i mean journey of questions and resolutions and 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 the pathway that you kind of you know put together fantastic really really very nice really very and i think i think you will inspire many people here uh, you know uh, uh just just by persistence and rigor you know it's it's a, it's a very important thing uh, uh mm -hmm. i have four i have four comments and questions uh if you would like to respond to uh first is uh, uh the idea of random and precise uh mm -hmm. you know uh one one is uh, uh, i see your work primarily kind of you know trying to uh trying to kind of you know uh make forces express themselves huh? so so it's basically the forces which are expressing themselves without mm -hmm. a human agency and and when forces are expressing themselves why is anything random then you know uh and and therefore is is there anything random at all you know hmm. because there couldn't be because if if you start thinking like that then nothing is random you know hmm. so 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 hmm. why use the term random at all and and is is and 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 therefore if everything is precise then what is a need to search for precision you know uh, and is precision also for you uh, a state of equilibrium really because 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 mm -hmm. because because it is the it is the uh, it is the you know it is the encountering of multiple forces that produce uh, uh, those works and, and 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 it is that equilibrium which kind of you know uh, 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 which is which is uh, which is, which probably you are calling it as uh, uh, as precision you know uh, it's it's not it's so 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 it's not random not precise but basically looking at force equilibriums to express themselves you know so that that that's that's so this is what what i feel second second uh, uh, comment question is uh the uh till the moment you talk and and anuj already mentioned about the videos in the in the in the presentation like like till the moment you see the robotic arm till the moment you see the ink dropping till the moment you see the pigeons moving the drawing by itself is unable to kind of you know put me through an ex through a visceral experience through a bodily experience of what the forces are you know so so the the drawing by itself is a is a is a is a, is, is really a wonderful pattern 
you know uh, in 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 the discussion of randomness and precision but 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 all those process of making the drawing actually i feel are the part of the drawing itself mm. you know if they are they are they are the drawing you know they are the uh, uh, th- there is where the drawing expresses itself you know so so drawing is really not the last image but actually that whole thing is a drawing because because then you, and and captured through your narratives your questions your i mean your intervention now was so instrumental in viscerally feeling that force uh, you know uh, uh, together you know um, so 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 that's the second second thing where is the drawing really where where does the drawing happen really you know uh, does it happen in that process or or uh, in in the final thing it doesn't i i i i, I never i like from this presentation it appeared it happens in this in, in your discussion the third question or or a comment is on your idea of autonomous environment and mechanistic process you know which is i think which is an extremely kind of you know and that is uh, that has been uh, uh, your uh, you know uh, uh, direction for probably in the last Uh, the last few years to kind of you know shift the agency from human being to to really to really these forces uh, uh, you know figure out apparatuses to kind of you know really for these forces to work and then and then produce a uh, expression for themselves you know? so so that 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 appears and in that i've asked you this before where do you stop where do you stop <laughs> to kind of you know uh, and 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 but more importantly i was feeling i was thinking the idea of layering the idea of layering that happens in 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 that in in that force expression you know and 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 the drawing somehow kind of you know gets built through that through those layerings and layerings and which which completely kind of you know probably if they continue forever they completely kind of blur the eye completely completely uh, you know uh, 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 smudge the drawing completely so mm. you in you, you you intervene at some moment to kind of you know pull the drawing out of the process you know so so that is there is you i mean even though it is an autonomous environment your intervention is there to pull it out pull the drawing out at a moment and my final last a uh, comment question is uh, and you and you mentioned this and this is this is this is really a provocation can the everybody every day produce a built form because because even in the even in the nepal project which is which is fantastic i felt there is a process by which a final form is produced and stabilized the life is expected to happen subsequently after that you know now can there be a process or processes where or, or where everyday processes uh life processes you know produce the built form simultaneously you know because because that would that would be that would be much closer to what you are thinking and doing actually you know like like everyday activities producing their own uh, built form and uh, this thing yeah so these are my four questions and it was fantastic uh, uh, edward uh, like always uh, fantastic uh, listening to you all this mm-hmm. yeah. thanks thanks anil great uh prasad thank you so much i will uh, i will make you a lot of phone calls when i will work <laughs> on my doctorate which i haven't started yet because there is a lot of uh, a lot of uh, super critical thoughts eh? um same as you anush uh, also i think these are super valuable um the the question of random and and, and precise um yeah i'm i'm actually wondering like how much do i use the word random and and how much do i do i believe in it um i think if i use it maybe i use it a little bit as a kind of shortcut because in 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 this work that you see in actually nothing is nothing is random right uh, uh um no. maybe maybe I, i don't know when 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 we call something random is it i mean without going into 
what random means mathematically. Uh, I think there is a question of, of um, we use the word random on a kind of common level when, when maybe we don't understand something or maybe when we are not able to, to control it or maybe when we are not able to plan it. No? And then, and then it's, or, or maybe that the control of it is beyond, is beyond ourselves. And, and therefore it kind of maybe responds to a, to a higher complexity than the one that we can, uh, that we can, then we can, uh, uh, that we can control or, or that we can understand or that we can, that we can predict. So, so, and I think that a little bit as, as I was saying before, I think, I don't know, we, 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 as architects, somehow we have to try to be in, con at least architecture in the traditional sense is a discipline in which we have to be in control of everything, no? whatever we're not in control of. Yeah. Um, it's something we have to pay for on the building side or go to yeah. court. Yeah. Or, uh, or... Uh -huh. um, uh, so, so we are in a certain way control freaks, no? and, and, uh, and, but then does it make sense to try to control the world? Um, but I think it is, it is possible to, to, to not have control and, and yet to be precise. No? I think we can, we can, we can, these two, these two, uh, these two capacities are not necessarily opposed. I think that, I think that they can work together, but it's true that it, it, it means uh, a huge opening up. And to be honest, like to come to your fourth comment now, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 form, the, the, the project in Nepal is, it's, I mean, it's very deterministic, no? It's okay, yeah, this logic yeah. needs to be like that. And it, it incorporates very little of these ideas of the, uh, I think as you've noticed, no, of, 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 of this um, <laughs> kind of go with the flow of let the force speak. And, yeah. and, and why does it do that? Because I'm not managing yet, uh, because I haven't yet found a way to get a piece of architecture to integrate all of this resting on these forces. And, I'm, and we're really looking at it, no? we're really searching. Um, but I have to say that, that, that so far it's, it's, it's very hard right? to, 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 to try to create a framework or to try to create a process in which, um, uh, in, 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 in which, in which the build form integrates these notions of, of indeterminacy. And I, they are, there are some that do that, right? And, and these are the, the ones that in theory, society doesn't like, or, or, or maybe, maybe political uh, systems don't like, which is the ones of informal housing. The ones in, 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 in which, for example, there are many actors uh, of which everybody somehow has a, um, has a say or, 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 or acts actually within a kind of, with a kind of collective, right? And, and architecture in, at the end often is a very top-down discipline no? where one person or yeah, actually one person decides and then afterwards this affects a lot of, a lot of people. So um, to me, your questions remind me how much, how much work we have still to do, no? how much work I have still to do in order to continue this work on, on that has been initiated with this drawing. I, I think drawing for me, it's, it's interesting because when I get asked to present myself, um, people see drawings and then they think that drawing is my, is, my, uh, is my topic, but the topic is not drawing, right? The drawing is just a vector in order to explore um, these, these, uh, these notions, right? And, and I think that eventually it's not about drawing, it's about design, right? Whether architectural design, whether painting, whether uh, where the music, uh, so many, so many, so many fields. I'm interested in all of these fields, but what I'm interested in is, is really how do you, um, how do you, how do you design in them in a, in a kind of, in, in a way that, that considers these other forces uh, that you really uh, like nicely, nicely talked about. Um, I think the, the answer probably is, is quite vague, but I think it's because the topic is so, is so wide and so broad and, and, and so very exciting. And I remember our last conversation and, and, and uh, you made me really think about these questions. Um, and I actually, your question just stimulates me to, to, to search more. Uh, and I, I'm, really, I'm really thankful for that. Um, the, 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 another question that I think is really critical, no, that, or another point that you made is the one of, of of the 
of the process being the drawing itself, right? And when the process stops, uh, uh, the drawing is somehow or could be considered dead, right? Uh, this is, I don't know. For me, it's maybe in the work of Jean Tingeli, the Swiss artist that has been constructing huge machines now back in the 60s, 70s, uh, where, 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 art, where, where art becomes a performance, right? Even kind of plastic art, plastic art, that's a French way to say, but fine arts. So not dance or not, but, but fine art, sculpture, uh, uh, of which the, the kind of a sculpture can propose a performance as, a, as an art piece. And when time gets embedded within the piece and the piece, when it is uh, inanimated, has, doesn't have its function anymore. Right? And, and, and also there, I'm, when I speak to, to, to museums or to galleries, then I'm often asked, no, do you value more the drawing? And the process, and of course, the answer is the process. Um, but 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 uh, but I, I will. There is also a certain excitement about the drawing itself, right? And I think it it is also necessary to, at some point, kind of finalize the drawing. And and and, and when is the right moment to finalize it? I think to that there's no answer. But um, there is something that yes is important and that justifies the necessity to stop the process. Is actually the comparison of it, right? Because I, 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 in order to understand or, or, yeah, in order to understand this indeterminacy, um, uh, you need actually to be able to compare, uh, or at least one way is actually to compare outcomes, right? And, and that's why with our students, we work with kind of a lot of precision in the setup. All the drawings are two hours, all the drawings are in the same place, all the drawings are with the same tool, all the drawing are with the same line thickness, all the drawing are with the same force. But then the only thing that varies, the only one variable is actually the force itself. No? More mm -hmm. wind, less wind, more pigeon, less pigeon. And, um, and, 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 and the drawing at the end is, is nothing else than a tool to measure, right? It's to measure if it's done well, if the context is done well, then the, then the drawing, the emerging drawing is the, uh, is the, is the, is the, the, the kind of witness uh, mm -hmm. or is the manifestation of these differences. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why for me, it's also really important sometimes to take these drawings out of context because they actually bring the discussion on a, on a different path. On a, on a, I don't know if it's a different level, but at least a different path. And it, it, uh, it, 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 they, suddenly this drawing helps you to look at the world again in a different manner. You know? um, uh, so at the end, you know, both have a value. And, and when I'm being asked, well, what do you value more, the drawing or the, or the, or the, uh, or the process? It, for me, it's still impossible to say. And, and sometimes I run experiments in which the process is boring and then I'm unhappy, or in which the process is very interesting, but the, the, the drawing that comes out of it is, is not mm -hmm. strong. And please don't ask me to define strong. <laughs> um, but, in, but in that case, I'm also frustrated. If, if either the process or the drawing is not... Uh, uh, strong and again, don't ask me to define strong. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, then uh, then then there is a certain frustration, which means that one is not more important than, than the other. They they somehow both they both need to be there and, and yeah. But but just 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 one intervention yet. I mean, uh, what you said was very important. You know, you stop the drawing where it allows you to measure. You know, that that is a, that I think that that's a very important formulation. Uh, uh, stop the layering where where it allows you to measure, you, you, where you uh, where it allows you to see uh, the force expression more clearly. Because if the layering increases, then you don't see, and you, at a decreased moment, you don't kind of you know hold it. But but uh, at that precise moment where you can measure, uh, so I think I think that's a very important articulation here. Yeah, thanks, 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 sir. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Prasad. Uh, okay, uh, so Rupali also wanted to add. Uh, something. Uh, uh, Rupali, if you can switch on your mic. And... Yeah. yeah. Hi. Hi, Edward. So lovely to see you and, and really amazing. The, the amount of rigor that you've put into the work is, is amazing. Just to kind of look at you know, the quest, constant questions that you're asking and developing on those. Um, so I, I mean, I, of course, also, I think some of the things have been discussed already in, in what, you know, in the last conversation, but I'm going to go ahead and, and, you know, ask something, you know, a little more precise from within there itself. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think, um, I mean, two questions. Um, one is, uh, uh, you know, like, like the whole idea that in some ways you, um, 
and you began with this whole idea that you your one foot is in architecture and one foot is in art right like in some ways you you from art we come you know we ask questions of who we are you know where we are located you know what where what, what is what, what is the idea of the human you know and in some ways uh, the ways the, of of sort of working with the idea of forces uh, where you where we sort of located within this is is in that sense you know asking that you know a, a, a kind of larger philosophical question right um so i'm just wondering if then the foot in architecture somewhere sort of come you know brings back a certain sort of baggage of the way we know of uh you know spatial thinking you know and and let me kind of you know go further into that for example you call things a map you know like it's a map but i'm wondering if it is really a map because a map is you know something that is um in some ways used to quantify something that is used to uh, you know pin something down um something that is able to you know be that control sort of mechanism but what you're drawing is is more than a map right it's it's really sort of a, a cosmic sort of force right that you you almost sort of feel you are you're part of which a map doesn't a map sort of you know in some ways distances you so i'm wondering whether the use of of the category of the map is useful um you know and then and then when you sort of also go into looking at uh, architecture itself um you know can some of these ways of you know almost sort of poetic ways of thinking of uh, you know of 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 forces and other things come into the into the thinking of of the space itself you know and i think you've said a little bit of that because perhaps it is it's to do with you know the construction and parts um also this very sort of heavily looking at older you know references of architecture to then come back and reprint or replicate in this you know could there be and for example i the, i was really struck by the plan particularly you know of, of some of those spaces because there's a kind of almost baggage of of modern ways of thinking of space that comes back you know whereas whereas in the in this whole sort of cosmic uh, understanding of space all of that is you know in those drawings particularly is so so powerful that all of that way all of those ways of looking at of 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 sort of rational space and you know inhabitation is gone you know so i'm just wondering if the next step would be to completely throw open you know ways of of thinking of of you know spatial plan you know spatial thinking um you know in in new ways in in the way you sort of have been moving ahead with uh, your own research so yeah that's it yeah 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 i i i like a lot the the questioning of the work uh, of the word uh, of the word map um uh and i i i think i agree with you i i remember very nice moments where where i was working with my students in paris and and so i was sending them to these parks and then they had to use you know computation tools in order to well they had to go to the park and then gather data they had to show me their sketchbook where they had just actually managed to understand quant uh, qualities as quantities no as i always told them if you can understand a phenomenon in terms of numbers mm. then you can do this exercise no so so I, it it went all the way to at some point a student telling me that she had been measuring uh, happiness in a park and then she was running behind people to try to measure the the width of their smiles uh, sometimes it reached these these absurd moments but um but so you know they would they would abstract qualities into quantities they would they would uh, find ways to because essentially in order to kind of compare no to compare situations in 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 space um and at the end of this process um they would come up with with drawings that were always stunning they were, they, 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 they were so talented uh what was coming back was just really beautiful no? and and then <laughs> often it was it was so beautiful that they were really struggling to explain what had actually happened and and i was giving them an exercise and it it's uh, it it was very nice is um i was kind of uh how did i do it I, they would have to present two people they would so they would be the author of the drawing let's say and then they would have to bring a friend and the friend was the user of the drawing mm -hmm. and so that person had to kind of some they didn't have to dress up but they had to pre to pretend to be i don't know a shepherd or to be uh, uh, uh someone from an advertising uh, company or from and and so that person had to make a reading of that drawing in order to um in order to to kind of influence the way that 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 he or she inhabits 
uh, inhabit space no? or, 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 or find itself in, in space. And, and then the, the anecdotes or the, or the stories are very nice. No? If, if like um, on, the on, a, on, a, on the topographical map, um, the, fa the fact that darker areas represent steeper areas in the landscape and, and, and the shepherd might want to walk only in the light areas of the map because they are more shallow and therefore it's easier to walk for, 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 uh, for the animals. Uh, I think is is also what enables um, uh, it's also what a drawing invites to do, right? Whether is it, it is a it is just a drawing or whether it is a map of an of an actually no, whether it is a map of an existing place, whether it is a drawing that has been drawn according to by the information of an existing place, or whether it is a drawing that has been done with with some other information or or even without information. So the the what I like about this idea of the map is that it invites a certain reading of a drawing, a certain use potentially, and I think it it sends back to the it it it, it sends back to the world, you know, uh, and 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 uh, and that is a, a field that I that I enjoy a lot. But I I also really like what you say of the fact that 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 maybe it's not the only way to read that, or maybe they go beyond this idea of referring back to the space and they become something in themselves, right? Something that 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 I think opens new worlds and, uh, and, and opens new ideas. So, um, yeah, again, I, I, I wrote your comments down and they're, and they're, very, they're very useful for me. Um, the, 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 the one of, of, you know, of the flow plan of, of what, is, what is the kind of architectural, um, how, how can this research continue in, in space and continue at the moment, it's, it's very easy to do. It's very easy to understand this work as kind of analytical work in the field of architecture, and also, also easy, I think, to understand this work as the as the the the, the production of drawing, you know, and therefore to have it on a wall or to have it on a, as a nice feature. Where, where, of course, it's most difficult is to 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 have this continuity within the field of of, uh, of actually. I don't know what it is, but maybe it's designed something that other people could use. You know? And I think where, where, for me, the project where I feel we have gone further is this, is this, um, it's this project in Paris, it's the, the Biennale project where we have the sand map, and then we have this, uh, this, this sand map that is being translated uh, in, into the drawing of a vectorial drawing, you know? call it a city, call it a, 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 a a microscopic tissue, whatever it is. They, 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 of course, when we were designing this drawing, and we were not drawing it, we were designing what this drawing should do. You know? um, we were, of course, talking about density of, of blocks, uh, access between them, uh, certain sizes. So we were actually using, in order to create this drawing, we were using architectural um, uh, uh, intentions, uh, I would say. And then, but, but for the outcome, that was a drawing and was not to construct a city. But I, I think that there we kind of opened, uh, I don't know if we opened the door or if we just pushed this research a little bit further into, uh, into um, a way to, to think of the territory. Uh, you know, like this drawing somehow goes back to the territory and it, it's not about the drawing itself anymore. It's about a, a, a projected reality that is not fixed, that is dynamic, that can incorporate change, that can incorporate unexpected, uh, change over time. Of course, limitedly, you know, it cannot consider so much, but it can, it can, it starts to consider a bit of it. And I think in, 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 as a response to, 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 to the comments, uh, to your comment, but also the ones before, no, I think maybe that is the piece of work where, where I think, uh, there is the kind of, the, there is a kind of, uh, the, the, the one that most addresses this idea of, of how this can come back into the world, not under the form of a drawing, but under the form of, 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 uh, of, of, a, of a built form, right? Um, even though in that installation, there is no people involved, right? But maybe the sand could be the people, right? Maybe the, the, the sand could be, it could be a cloud, it could be a contamination cloud, it could be a water resource, it could be a mountain, but maybe it could also be the, the kind of collaborative force of, of, uh, of people. And, and, and it could be that, that this city or these architectural spaces they end up crafting themselves based on 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 the force that that the users uh, are actually um, 
uh, processing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Edward. We'd love to follow your research Great. in the future. Great. Thanks. thanks to you. It's making me think a lot, actually. Thanks, Rupali. Uh, Sanjay has a kind of a, a trivia question. I'll read it out to you. Uh, he's uh, referring to the Sun Fan sand drawings, and he's asking if the Sun Fan sand drawings interpreted as human settlements are realized into actual settlements mechanically created with natural agencies uh, like the sun, wind, etc. Would they create new ways of living? Um, and uh, I mean, partly the question answers itself, but if you want to respond, it would. Okay, uh, I'm reading the question again. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's a good question. Uh, I, I, I'm 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 looking at this mechanically created, right? Which is a um, which is a slightly scary uh, set of words, um, uh, and 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 it's a consequence of working with certain automated process. You know? we, we we there is. I think, in, especially in our school where we work a lot with technology, there is this, I don't know if it's a belief, I think it's not a belief, but this thought that, that design could be automated, right? That they are, uh, and, and actually uh, the world is going in that direction, right? Students often have to learn how to use Revit, uh, which, is a, which is a tool that I don't appreciate uh, because I find it, it, it really stereotypes uh, the way that we think. Um, but my work explores this question of, of how to automate. In other words, you know, I, I set up these drawing processes. I set up an installation in the museum um, and, and uh, it never quite works like that. But when it's installed, the canvas is white and then we press a button and then we leave. And then the, the machine makes a drawing which, uh, and we come back sometimes at the end of the day. Uh, that is in the best case scenario. Sometimes it, it happens like that, but often other, in other circumstances, we have to just stay there to make sure it works. But then at the end of the day, you go back and then there's a drone. Like, oh, great. Uh, you know, I was, I was, I spent my day walking in the forest and then, uh, and then this drawing was created of which I was partially involved. So that's like a very pleasant, mm -hmm. pleasant feeling. Um, and of course, in this case, this drawing, it's not the, the kind of, it's not the kind of automation in the Fordian way that I know exactly what needs to come out and, and it needs to be a hammer. And if it's not a hammer, uh, the process is, needs to be re, re, uh, re, uh, re, reworked. Um, but this idea of, 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 of a mechanically created, I think is, is, a, is, a, is very potentially very dangerous because it's what, um, if we can mechanically create or mechanically design, it's, it's where is the creativity, where is the critical thinking? Uh, and, 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 you know, I mean, I think Fordian models of mass production has also influenced uh, a certain architecture that is around the globe. And, 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 uh, and that is an architecture that is really um, maybe very little connected to its, to, its, to its context, right? And we talked about this the last time we had a, we had a, a, a conversation. So I'm convinced that, that architecture should not be mechanical or automated. I think that it's a very creative discipline that is mm -hmm. so complex that, mm -hmm. uh, that um, it can be analyzed in all so many ways. I think at the end of human mind with its incredible function mm -hmm. of the intuition, uh, mm -hmm. it's still coming up with, with really valuable, most valuable, I think, I think, uh, I think solutions. And I think in that sense, for me, there is no worry. I, I know that we will always be the best designers. We will, we will always be the, 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 we will be always better than, than automated processes. But I think having said that, I think that we are stronger if we can, if we can also understand and, and, partially, and partially use them. But I think this, this figure, this group of figures or these people behind, they are, they are still really necessary in a, in a design process. Um, yeah. yeah, and new ways of living. I mean, I hope so. No, I think uh, I think we, we we there's always things to to improve. I think uh, I don't know. I think also nice to look at the past past to, to find also nice ways of living. No, uh, mm -hmm. but also I think there is there is there is things to invent uh, from both from from the architect side, but also mainly from the from the community side. Yeah. 
um i think there are we have exhausted all the questions uh, and uh, i would like to say as a, a kind of uh, to sum up the uh, you know discussion i think uh, it's very interesting that your work has provoked us provoked us to think of so many uh, ideas uh, which necessarily actually shake up our uh, uh ways of categorizing things i mean uh, they i mean the drawings that you presented actually do not fit into neat categories and that's what pushes us to think and i'm compelled to think of you know when, as i think of your drawing more drawings more and more i'm i'm kind of compelled to think of them as improvisations and when i think of improvisations i'm uh, again kind of uh, thinking of them uh, in terms of uh, uh indian classical music where you know unlike the uh the western classical music which are very rigorously rehearsed and performed exactly like the rehearsal is done uh indian classical music actually is uh, never uh, you can never it's all about improvisation so mm. even the performer does not know what will come out when he goes on stage he or she goes on stage and performs mm -hmm. and so in that sense your drawings kind of evoke i don't know if you have ever gotten chance to listen to indian classical music but maybe yeah. uh, maybe i can uh, yeah so so yeah there are just rules and then the rules yeah. kind of are performed on stage uh, yeah. and they always produce absolutely new things so no two performances by a single um, artist are same and i think that that is what uh, bridges uh, in some sense prasad and rupali's uh, comments about the poetics of your drawings as well as the the introduction of uh, or the force kind of vectors that control in some sense the the shape of uh, things that you produce so so yeah with that note i would like to really thank you for uh, you know sharing all your work and uh, discussing with us us at length about your practice and we really hope that uh, we are able to kind of uh, engage more with your work and probably do something more meaningful together in the coming future so sure. thank you edward so much and uh, thank, thank you so you. much uh, yeah yeah thank you so much i want to say that i also really enjoyed your last comment i think the the improvisation in in um, in indian music is is something that is a uh, i don't know well uh but but um but uh yes improvisation in 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 western music is is not something that is there originally it's all about you know transcribing following um documenting keeping and and there is a tiny space for the for expression but yeah uh, and of course it's there but then it's really about it's really about respecting and i think uh it doesn't mean that indian music does not have as many rules and as much as a structure and as much as as a as a as a kind of theoretical context but it's a very different way to 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 uh to live no or to express or to yeah, or to yeah, inhabit yeah. and i think it's it i think is a very nice note to 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 finish the conversation on because i can really identify to that so thank you thanks thanks edward and thank you all people who uh, made time to uh, join us and i just want to say that uh, next week on 17th march which was the day uh, last year when the lockdown was announced uh, we uh, vsc are going to announce a, a year long project collectively done called the covid glossary and so i would invite you all to join for its inauguration uh, and it's put together by the school of environment and architecture with the support of goth institute uh, and other partners so please join us on 17th which is uh, which is not a friday it's a wednesday but do join and uh, uh, we'll discuss more thank you so much and uh, good evening